Okay, I'm Dr. Peterson. I'm from the Department of uh, Diagnostic Imaging at the Ottawa Hospital. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about basics of chest imaging. First of all, we're going to talk about the anatomy that we see on a chest x-ray. All right, well, this is a PA view of the chest. And we call it a PA view because the patient stands with the chest against uh, the front of the chest against a, a film. And the, Im the radiation goes from the back of the patient through the front to the film. So this is a PA view. And you can see that we can see many structures on a PA view. First of all, in the center of, of the uh, x-ray is the heart. Okay. On the right side, we have the chamber, which is called the right atrium. And on the left side, we have the left ventricle. Now, the reason we see the right atrium and the right ventricle is because there is air next to soft tissue. X-rays tend to go, more X-rays go through air than go through soft tissue. And the soft tissue tends to stop many of the X-rays. So we have an interface here between um, a X-ray rich area and an X-ray poor area. And that interface allows us to see the diaphragms on each side and allows us to see the mediastinal structures. Now, when I look at a chest film to start with, the first thing I do is I look at the diaphragms. Both diaphragms should go almost to the center, to the spine. You can see the spine down the center. And both diaphragms should go right up to that area. Then I look at the mediastinal structures on both sides. Now, on the left side, if we start at the top, the first little notch we see there is called the aortic arch. Okay, now immediately below the aortic arch is a white area, which is the left pulmonary artery. Now, if you follow the airway down the trachea, which is black in the middle, you'll see that it branches at the level of the crine, and it gives off a right main stem and a left main stem bronchus. The left main stem bronchus is black, and we can see it coming out in the hilar region on the left side. And above that is a white area, which is the left pulmonary artery. The left pulmonary artery goes up and over the left main stem bronchus. Immediately below that is the left ventricle. And the whole side here is formed by um, the left ventricle. The reason we see the left ventricle, again, is the interface between the air in the lung and the soft tissue in the mediastinum. Now if we go to the right side and start at the top, there's a line that comes down straight from from above and ends at the level of the right atrium. This is formed by the superior vena cava. And actually, it's an interface, white on one side, black on the other for the lung. Immediately above the right main stem bronchus is a small almond-shaped structure, which is the azagous vein. Now, on the right side, the pulmonary artery and the bronchi divide uh, the pulmonary artery sits in front of the main stem bronchus, and they divide together as they go out into the lung. So you don't see the pulmonary artery separate from the bronchial tree on the right side. And finally, below that, we can see the, uh, the border of the right atrium. So those are some of the things we look for on the PA view of the chest. Now we're going to go to the lateral view. Now the lateral view is difficult, and many people don't like to look at the lateral view, but it's extremely important. And again, we'll start with the diaphragms. The right diaphragm is the diaphragm that goes all the way to the front. That's because there's no soft tissue to interfere with it. And we, the air from the lung is sitting against the diaphragm all the way to the front of the chest. On the other hand, the left diaphragm is the diaphragm that stops at the heart. The heart is soft tissue density. And as soon as the diaphragm gets to soft tissue, we no longer see an interface between air and soft tissue. So we lose the border there. So the left diaphragm stops at the heart. The right diaphragm goes all the way to the front. Now, if we look at the heart, which is sitting just behind the sternum, the front part of the heart is formed by the right ventricle. The posterior border of the heart the superior aspect is formed by the left atrium, and the inferior aspect by the left ventricle. Now I want you to look at the airway, which is in the middle, and it's the black part here. Immediately front of the lower portion of the airway, just above the heart, is a round soft tissue area, which is about the size of your thumb. This is the right pulmonary artery. It sits in front of the airway. 
On the other hand, the left pulmonary artery, as I've told you, goes up and over the left main stem bronchus. And here you can see it as a white area that goes over to the back of, of the, the bronchus. And the bronchus has a big hole, a black hole that we see in the middle there. That's the left upper lobe bronchus right on. Okay. Now if we look at the lateral view, the retrosternal space is black. And it should always be that way. And if we go down the spine posteriorly, the lungs should get blacker as we go from the top to the bottom. These are normal things that we see on a lateral view. Just to go over a little more of the anatomy, this is a venogram. Okay? And th there's a needle in, and a vein in each arm in this patient, and we've injected dye. The dye comes down and it shows us the veins on each side. There's the right subclavian vein and the left subclavian vein and the brachiocephalic vein in the middle here. And where the brachiocephalic vein joins the right subclavian vein, we have the superior vena cava. Now you can see the vena cava as it goes down and it empties into the uh, right ventricle. Here, this, this interface between the lung and the mediastinum is formed at that level. So we've got white on one side, black on the other. And that is where the superior vena cava sits, and that's where you should look on an x-ray to find it. If we look on cross-sectional imaging, this is at the level of the aorta, which you can see here. We can see the superior vena cava sits on the right side, just adjacent to the ascending aorta. Now, on this view, the, to your left is the right side of the chest, to your right is the left side of the chest, and that's just the way CT scans are done. Here we have uh, what we call the azagous vein. Now the azagous vein is a vein which is a pathway for blood to be brought back from the heart from below the diaphragm. It's an alternate pathway to the inferior vena cava. And as you know, most of the blood comes back to the heart from the lower limbs and from the abdomen through the inferior vena cava. But this is an alternate pathway. And it, the azagous vein comes up from the abdomen, crosses the spine, and forms this almond-shaped structure next to the trachea and above the right main stem bronchus. This azagous vein, uh, sometimes, and here we can see the course of the azagous vein, which is enlarged in this case, as it comes up, crosses the spine, and comes behind the trachea. At the level of the main stem bronchus, it crosses and joins the superior vena cava. And that's how the blood gets back to the heart. So here we've got a picture. We've got the aorta. We've got the azagous vein, which comes up, goes over the right main stem bronchus to enter the superior vena cava. Now the pulmonary arteries, some people find it difficult. You have to keep looking to see the detail to be able to tell what's happening with the pulmonary arteries. Here is the left pulmonary artery. I have a catheter in that artery. and We've injected contrast. If you look, you can see the left main stem bronchus, and you'll see that the artery is above that bronchus. The right pulmonary artery is injected here. And we can see that the bronchus is behind the pulmonary artery. And you can see that it's branching normally into the lung. Here's a cross-sectional image again. The left pulmonary artery, this time, you can see it coming up. And I put a marker there. It's coming up. And if you look centrally, you can see that this is a level of the carina. You can see black there. This is the airway. So the white part is contrast media in the pulmonary artery, which is going up and over the left main stem. And on the next slide, we can see it posteriorly here. On the other hand, the right pulmonary artery sits in front of the bronchial tree. And here we can see it just behind the airway on the right side. Now this is just a, a diagram to try to show you how the arteries and veins differ. The arteries come out of the main pulmonary artery and are higher than the veins. They tend to branch out into the lung behind the veins. The veins come across the hyla and downward to empty into the left atrium. There are superior and inferior pulmonary veins on each side.
and these you can see on a CT scan very easily. On a chest x-ray it's a little more difficult, but often we see enlargement of the pulmonary veins, and these are vessels that are straight and that line up with the mediastinum and cross over the hilum as they're going downwards towards the left atrium. Here is a venous phase of a pulmonary angiogram. We can see the left atrium here and the pulmonary veins are coming down and across the hilar region. Now we know the hilar region because the catheter is in the pulmonary artery and the black part is the left main stem bronchus. So the veins are coming down and across to empty into the left atrium. Similarly, it happens on the right side. You can see the veins coming down and emptying into the structure centrally, which is the left atrium. On cross-sectional image, here we can see the left atrium and we see the pulmonary veins which are draining into the left atrium which is behind the heart. It's, it's one of the uh, posterior chambers of the heart. Now we're just going to go over a little bit of the anatomy of the um, lung and we're going to start with the right lung. It's important that you know the segments of the lung because they're easy to learn and the lobes. Now on the right side we have a middle lobe, an upper lobe, and a lower lobe. Now the, and the, it's, it's just the way it's um, laid out here. The upper lobe is at the top, the middle lobe is next, and the lower lobe is below that. So we're looking straight on frontal view, AP view, and we've got the right side here and the left side over there. So as we're coming down, there's a major fissure on this side and a minor fissure. The minor fissure is the first line we see crossing um, the, the lung, and the major fissure is the second line. The minor fissure separates the middle lobe from the upper lobe, and the major fissure separates the upper and middle lobe from the lower lobe. Now if we follow the bronchial tree out, we can see that there's an upper lobe bronchus. There are three segments in the upper lobe. There's the superior segment, the anterior segment, and the posterior segment. Then there's a middle lobe bronchus, uh, intermediate stem bronchus, which uh, comes off below that. It's a very fairly big bronchus, and it gives rise to both the middle lobe and lower lobe bronchi. The middle lobe bronchus has two segments, the medial and the lateral segment. The medial segment is the part of the middle lobe that sits right next to the heart border. The lower lobe has five segments. It has a superior segment, a medial and lateral segment and an anterior and posterior segment and we can see these better on the lateral view. So here's a lateral view. You'll see the front is off to your left and the back is to your right. When we're looking at the lung. You can see the major fissure sort of trailing up through there. We don't really see much of the minor fissure on this view. The upper lobe bronchus we can see coming off, giving off a posterior segment, anterior segment, and superior segment bronchi. The middle lobe is coming off, and you can see it's giving a medial and lateral segment. And the lower lobe bronchus, the superior segment is the highest one, and then the four basal segments, which we can see outlined here in the lower lobe. Now we'll go to the left lung. The left lung is smaller than the right lung and that's because there has to be room for the heart to sit there. So if we look at this we can see that there's a main stem bronchus and then we have the bronchus to the upper lobe. The segments are a little different on the left side and we only have two lobes. We have an upper lobe and a lower lobe. These two lobes are divided by a, a single major fissure which you can see here. Now the upper lobe has three segments. It has an apical posterior segment, an anterior segment, and a lingular segment. The lingular segment is the part that sits right next to the apex of the heart. And it has two um, uh, uh, bronchi that come off, a superior bronchus and an inferior bronchus. It's a fairly big um, bronchus and is equivalent to the middle lobe on the right side. The lower lobe bronchus is a little different as well. It also has, it only has four segments, a superior segment, a medial uh, lateral, a medial anterior segment, a posterior segment, and a lateral segment. And I might have that wrong, but I think that. Here we go to the lateral view, 
and again you can see the upper lobe bronchus dividing the lingular branch goes down anterior and apical posterior branches as we said we can see the lower lobe bronchus with the the uh, superior segment and the other basal segments coming off all right I'll just give you a minute here this is just a sort of quiz and we can look at this and I'm going to ask you what number one is. Number one is the trachea. Number two? Number two is the right main stem bronchus. Number three? Number three is the left main stem bronchus. Number four? Number four is the pulmonary artery. Number five? Number five is the pulmonary veins, which are going across the hyla region. Number six. Number six is the pulmonary artery, which is coming from the hilum and going down, branching into the lower lobe. Number seven. Number seven is also a pulmonary vein, which is coming in, and, and the inferior pulmonary vein on that side going into the area of the left atrium. Number eight. Number eight is the arch of the aorta. Number nine is the superior vena cava. Number ten is the azagous vein. Number eleven is the right atrium. And number twelve, the border is formed by the left ventricle. All right. Now we'll go to the lateral view and see if we can figure out what the structures are on the lateral film. Okay, number one. Number one is the trachea. Number two. Number two is the right intermediate stem bronchus, and maybe I didn't tell you that before, and it's not really that important. Number three is the left main stem bronchus, which is seen end on as a whole on the lateral film. And that's where the pulmonary artery goes up and over. Number four is the right upper lobe bronchus. And sometimes we see two black holes on the lateral. And if we do, the uppermost one is the right upper lobe bronchus. Number five is the left pulmonary artery. Number six is the right pulmonary artery. Number eight, seven is the confluence of the pulmonary veins which are going into the left atrium. Number eight is the aorta. Number nine are the vessels to the head, the brachiocephalic vessels. They form a little bit of a shadow there on the lateral film sometimes. Number ten, that heart border is formed by the right ventricle. Number eleven, is the area of the left atrium and 12 is the left ventricle. Now we've got to remember that the right diaphragm goes all the way to the front and the left diaphragm stops at the heart. Now we're going to talk about the chest x-ray and disease. There are two basic patterns that we talk about in chest disease. There's aerospace disease, and there's interstitial lung disease. These are two separate entities. If we look at the basic um, lobule or structure of the lung, it's called an asinus, okay? And it's, it's an air sac. It's filled with air. And there's certain quantities that are, that are here. If you look at the top of this diagram, you'll see there's an artery and an airway. And the two of them sit next to each other. <coughs> Anywhere in the lung that you go, that you find an artery, you're going to find an airway right next to it. So you can always identify the, the artery by a bronchus, which is sitting right next to it. Now, <coughs> the airway comes down and forms these air sacs here. And these air sacs are, are designed so that we can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide across the thin membrane that separates these air sacs from the uh, network of blood vessels that surrounds them. And the blood vessels, of course, are supplied by the artery. 
So in between the two of them we have what is called the parenchymal interstitial space. And this is a fine network of interstitial tissue that holds the things together, that holds the blood vessels next to the air sacs and allow that oxygen exchange to happen. When we have diseases in the parenchymal interstitial space, it interferes with our ability to um, exchange oxygen across that membrane. There are other interstitial spaces. There's a bronchovascular interstitial space which uh, travels down along the arteries and along the airways. This interstitial space is sometimes uh, uh, associated with or seen to be abnormal in patients with pulmonary edema. That interstitial space connects with the subpleural interstitial space which goes all the way around each one of these lobules. So we have airway, we have artery, we have air sacs, and we have two separate interstitial spaces. One which communicates with the bronchovascular bundles and the pleural, and the second one which is parenchymal and holds these um, <coughs> air sacs um, and allows oxygen. Okay, first we're going to talk, talk about air sacs. And whenever we talk about airspace disease, we talk about consolidation. And I know you've heard this word and probably don't know what it means. Well, basically what it means is solid lung. It means that all those air sacs that we see are filled with something. They can be filled with blood, pus, uh, fluid. And when that happens, this is called consolidation. It implies, the word consolidation implies that there is airspace disease. And finally, consolidation can occur with or without volume loss. When it occurs with volume loss, we call it collapse or atelectasis. And when it occurs without volume loss, it's more likely a pneumonia or pulmonary edema, something like that. So first of all, we're going to talk about consolidation without volume loss. This is a lady who has a nodule <coughs> in her right lower lobe. And I, uh, I took her to uh, the angio suite and did a lung biopsy on, on that nodule. And after I was finished, uh, we got an x-ray that looked like this. Now the reason it looks like this is because she hemorrhaged into the tissue around the nodule. And this occurred after the biopsy was done. Now this is a really good example of consolidation. This is what it looks like and these are some of the things that you look for. You look for a white dense area in the lung and you look for what we call the silhouette sign. Now if you look at the diaphragm on the left side you can see the entire length of the diaphragm. However on the right side the mid portion of the diaphragm is lost and that is because there's soft tissue density in the hemorrhage adjacent to soft tissue density of the diaphragm and the interface between air and soft tissue is lost there so the whole diaphragm in that region is blurred. <coughs> this is what you have to look for when you're looking for consolidation. And this is a diagrammatic uh, depiction of, of what we see and basically we have the air sacs and in this lady the air sacs were filled with blood you'll notice that the volume of lung is exactly the same. Okay, So we don't lose any volume when this happens. One of the characteristics of consolidation is that it causes a silhouette sign. One of the other um, characteristics is that we get an air bronchogram. And here we can see a solid area of lung. This is an ammonia and we see this black branching structure out into the solid lung and this is an air bronchogram. We can often see this on a chest x-ray too. This is a patient with a right upper lobe pneumonia. Now, the right upper lobe is silhouetting, silhouetting the aortic arch. We don't see that clearly. We don't see the hilum clearly and we don't see the left, the upper portion of the left heart border clearly. This is this is part and parcel of the silhouette sign. We're not seeing those areas. There is also an area of increased density in this region. It's whiter than, than the rest of the lung. And finally, if you look very closely, you should be able to see 
a branching block structure within this consolidation, which is called an air bronchogram. Here's a close-up of the same area, and I think I put some arrows on those, those black branching structures. And that's what you should see. This is a patient who has diffuse airspace disease which is bilateral. And it really shows the bronchi in relief. You can see the central bronchi and you can see the branching black pattern into the solid lung on both sides. This is another case where there is no volume loss in either lung. The volume is maintained. So what are the characteristics of airspace disease and we've talked about? First of all, there's a homogeneous density or consolidation. There's a white part in the lung. Secondly, there's a silhouette sign. That means there's a loss of the distinct margins next to the area of consolidation. There's an air bronchogram, really important. The other thing you should notice about this is that <coughs> fluid or pus, when it's, it's moving through the lung, will move from one air sac to the other through what we call a pores a con. And this means that the distribution of disease will be non-segmental. And I know I haven't talked about that very much, but we'll get to it. So those are the characteristics of airspace disease, but in particular the top three are the ones that we look for. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about consolidation, a little more. On the left side, you have a normal chest x-ray. On the right side, there's a border missing. This is the same patient, okay? And on the right side, we cannot see the right heart border. There's white in that region, and the border is gone. If you look at the left heart border, it's nice and sharp. If you look at each diaphragm, they're nice and sharp. Now there's a part of the heart or, or the lung that sits next to the right heart border and that's the right middle lobe. And this appearance that we see here is characteristic of a right middle lobe consolidation. If we go to the lateral view, again we have the normal on one side and we look at the heart because we know the middle lobe sits in that region. And on the normal left film we can see there's no increased soft tissue density there. But if we go to the right film, same patient, you can see that there's increased soft tissue density over the area of the heart and that again means there's consolidation in the right middle lobe. So you put the two of those together and you say this patient has a right middle lobe. Here's another example. <coughs> if you look at the, the image on the left, this is normal for the same patient. You can see both diaphragms all the way along. You can see the heart borders nice and sharp, and the mediastinal borders are sharp as well. However, if we go to the, the, the film on the right side, we can see now that we can still see the right diaphragm, but the left diaphragm is obscured, and we have airspace disease in that region. So the left diaphragm is completely gone. It's silhouetted. We've got an area of increased density there that's white. And if you look very closely, you may be able to see an air bronchogram as well. Now the heart border is maintained, so we know the upper lobe and the lingula are normal. And we can place this area of consolidation in the left lower lobe. If we go to the lateral view on the same patient, if you look at the uh, film on the left, the normal film, you can see the right diaphragm <coughs> going all the way to the front and you can see the left diaphragm that comes up and stops at the heart. If you look at the lateral view on your right side where there is a pneumonia, you can see that we can see all of the right hemidiaphragm but we don't see any of the left hemidiaphragm anymore and that's because there's consolidation. The second sign that we see here is if you go down the spine on the normal film you'll see that it goes, gets blacker as you go down. However, on the abnormal film where there's a pneumonia, the upper portion of the spine is blacker than the lower portion. And that's because there's consolidation lying over the lower spine. <coughs> so what border is missing here? Well, I think that the left heart border is missing. 
all the other areas are clear. Okay, so this should mean that there's consolidation in the left lingula. And we'll go to the lateral view and here we have some increased density overlying the heart and that confirms the fact that there is a area of lingular consolidation. And here we are again. I think if you look very closely on the a uh, PA view, you can see an air bronchogram in that area of consolidation. So this is a lingular pneumonia. What border is missing now? Okay, well, you can see the right heart border if you look closely. You can see air adjacent to that portion of the heart. And if you look very closely, you can see a black line going around the atrium there. So all of this consolidation is silhouetting the posterior aspect of the right hemidiaphragm. So this should be a right lower lobe pneumonia. Can you see the air bronchogram, the branching pattern there? We go to the lateral film and we see a single diaphragm, that's the left diaphragm coming forward. The posterior aspect of the right diaphragm we don't see. The anterior aspect we can just barely see and then there's a straight line going up. This is the fissure. All the stuff that's white behind that fissure is consolidation and this is your uh, right lower lobe pneumonia. And here it is in PA and lateral together. Okay, what border is missing here? We can see all of the right diaphragm, or most of it. We can see the right heart border. We can see part of the left heart border. But the left diaphragm is totally missing. We've got increased density behind the heart and I think if you look closely you can see an air bronchogram there as well. So this is what a left lower lobe pneumonia looks like. We confirm this by going to the lateral view. We can see the right diaphragm which goes all the way to the front. The left diaphragm is completely obscured and we've got this white area. As we go down the spine it's white uh, at the bottom and you can see a definite air bronchogram going into that region. And this is a left lower lobe pneumonia. This is just a view that shows the two uh, PA and lateral. Okay, what borders are missing here? Okay, we can see the left heart border and the left diaphragm very clearly, but the right diaphragm we can't see and we can't see the right heart border. This would mean that there is consolidation in the right middle and lower lobes in this to confirm it, we go to the lateral view. We can see the right diaphragm on the lateral view with that big air bubble under it. We see uh, that's the left diaphragm. We see nothing of the right diaphragm at all. And there's consolidation over the heart and consolidation posteriorly. So we have a right middle and lower lobe pneumonia. And there you go. Right down. Okay. So we've talked about uh, some of the cause of airspace disease. Initially, um, we've talked about pneumonia, so we know that one of the commonest causes of airspace disease is infection. Okay, now a low bar pneumonia is the, lo the kinds of pneumonia we've been looking at. So those are pneumonias which uh, have a high output of fluid, and they cause this solid lung to look fairly dramatic. Hemorrhage is another cause of airspace disease. If someone's bleeding into their lung, they can fill those air spaces with blood. Pulmonary edema can cause airspace disease, particularly in the later stages when it becomes confluent in the lungs. There are certain neoplasms which cause airspace disease, and in particular, lymphoma and bronchoalveolar cell carcinoma can cause an appearance in the lung which is due to airspace disease and also shows the characteristics of airspace disease that we've talked about. And finally there's some weird idiopathic uh, causes which you don't have to worry about. So now we're going to talk a little bit about consolidation with volume loss. This is also called atelectasis or collapse. If we look at our diagram again we can see initially the normal on the uh, left side and on the right side we have a, a what looks like a collapse of that portion of the lung and we can see that there's volume loss 
that we're going to lose volume in all of these areas. Now in this particular case, if you go up into the proximal airway, you can see that there's something obstructing that airway. And often this is a cause of atelectasis or collapse. We get an obstruction to a proximal airway and the air gets resorbed below that point and everything collapses. This is called an endobronchial obstruction. However, you can also have passive atelectasis where you just get the something outside of the lung such as fluid in the pleural space will push on the lung and cause it to collapse. This is called passive atelectasis, but once again, there's consolidation there. You probably have a limited air bronchogram and you get volume loss. One of the commonest causes of this volume loss is a post-operative state. So here's a patient who uh, <clears throat> has a normal on the right side and on the left side there's left lower lobe collapse. Okay, Very common following surgery. They don't ventilate their lungs properly so portions of the lung actually collapse down. If we do a CT scan of that patient you can see that the collapsed lung tends to sit uh, in the left lower lobe, tends to sit posteriorly against the posterior chest wall and aorta. In this particular case, there is also evidence of volume loss in the mediastinum is shifted over towards that left side. So there are different signs of volume loss. There are direct signs and indirect signs, and you have to look for these when you see consolidation of any kind. So the direct signs of volume loss are movement of a fissure. That's the only direct sign there is. If you see movement of a fissure, out of its normal position, then there is volume loss in that lung. Now there are many indirect signs of volume loss and these are more common and we see them all the time. One is upward shift of the diaphragm so that if the left lung is collapsed, the left diaphragm is higher than the right one. Mediastinal shift towards the side of the collapse so that if the left lung is collapsed, the mediastinum shifts over towards the left side to fill that space. Movement of the main stem bronchi. Okay, If you look at that airway centrally, if the upper lobe is collapsed, the main stem bronchus is going to be pulled up. If the lower lobe is collapsed, the main stem bronchus is going to be pulled down. And that's an important sign. And finally, there's hypovascularity of the remaining lung due to hyperinflation, meaning that the lung looks darker than it. This is a <coughs> case of uh, right upper lobe collapse. Now, we can see a line here. This line is the minor fissure. The minor fissure usually sits well below this area, and here it's been pulled up. So this is a direct sign of volume loss in the upper lobe. We can see consolidation there, which is what we expect, okay, and volume loss as well. So when we have consolidation and volume loss, we look, we call this collapse. Now, some of the indirect signs of volume loss are the trachea is shifted over towards the right side, and the right diaphragm is shifted upwards. And if you look at the density uh, in the lower lobe, which is hyperinflated on the right side because the upper lobe is collapsed, you'll see that it's sort of darker and there are fewer vessels in the remaining aerated portion of the lung on the right side than there are on the left side. This is what it looks like on the lateral view. On the lateral view, if you look at the top of the lung, we can see two lines. One of those lines is the minor fissure, which is elevated, and the second line is the major fissure. And above this is this white area, which is the area of collapse. Okay, so that's what it looks like on PA and lateral view. This is a right upper lobe collapse with many of the signs. Now when the right upper lobe collapses, there are degrees. And the same thing happens with all of the areas of the lung when they collapse. So initially here on the film on your left, this is an early collapse and we can see the major fissure is up a little bit and we can see all this white area above there. 
However, if you go to the film on your right, with further collapse of the lung, the area of consolidation gets smaller and both of the uh, fissures move further towards the midline. Now some of the indirect signs of collapse on the film on your left are the diaphragm is up a little bit and the main stem bronchus is elevated. The mediastinum has shifted very little towards the right side. However, if you look at the second uh, uh, image on your right side, the diaphragm is higher, the trachea is bowed over towards the right side, and again you see both of those fissures which are which are um, um, have moved have moved so that there's volume loss. Now if we look at the remaining aerated portion of the lung you can see how much blacker it is um, than, than the normal lung on the left side. This is a lateral view and again on the first film on your left we can see a line that goes across here. This is formed by the minor fissure in front and the major fissure behind and everything above there is consolidation. When we get further collapse of the lung, those fissures come closer together as we can see on the second image on your right. Now it's important to note that in this consolidation that we see there is no air bronchogram. And the reason there's no air bronchogram is because there is a central endobronchial occlusion and these patients have a cancer sitting in their hilum and that is the reason there's no air bronchogram because all the air beyond that obstruction gets absorbed. A cancer is one of the commonest causes of collapse of the lung. Now this is an unusual pattern. Here we can see a faint area of increased density in the left lung but there's definite signs of volume loss. There's a, the trachea is shifted over just slightly. Can you see how the main stem bronchus is pulled up a little bit and definitely the left hemidiaphragm is higher than it should be. Now if we look for a silhouette sign, if you have to look for this, but we don't see the, uh, the border of the aorta, we don't see the hilar border and we don't see the upper aspect of the heart border. This means there's consolidation next to that portion of the lung. Now when you have consolidation and you have volume loss, it has to be in collapse. Okay? So we're going to go to the lateral view and you can see all this white area in front. This is all consolidation. This is all the area of the lung that is collapsing. This is a left upper lobe collapse. And here you can really see the difference in the diaphragms, okay? And, and how much higher the left one is than the right. So here's the two together. Again, consolidation, the silhouette sign on the PA view, difficult to see really, but there's definite evidence of volume loss. Go to the lateral film, you can see the consolidation in front, and this is a left upper lobe collapse. Now as the left upper lobe collapses further, it's the same as the right upper lobe, you get a change in the appearance. So in early collapse you have more consolidation there with more silhouetting, and then as the <coughs> lung collapses further, it moves closer and closer to the anterior chest wall and you get less consolidation. You always have the signs of volume loss, however. And here are the lateral views for these two. So early collapse, we have a lot of consolidation in the lung and here's the fissure. You can see the major fissure there. And as the lung collapses further, that fissure moves forward and the area of consolidated lung becomes smaller. Now, sometimes we get collapse of the right lower lobe as well. We can get collapse of any area. But this is an example of a right lower lobe collapse. I think you can tell there's volume loss. Okay, the bronchus is pulled way down and it actually, it stops right in the middle of an area of consolidation which is that triangular shape. That straight line is caused by a fissure which has moved in and that's the major fissure. Okay, now if you look at the lung on both sides you can see that there are more vessels on the left side than there are on the right and again this is a sign that the left 
or the right upper lobe is hyperinflated to make up for the loss of volume in the lower lobe. If we go to the lateral film, here we can see the left hemidiaphragm which stops at the heart but there's we can't see any of the right hemidiaphragm. And if we go down the spine we can just see this vague area of increased density down there. And the increased density again means there's consolidation in that portion of the lung we, but we don't see the fissures, we don't see anything else on this view. Okay? So this is a right lower lobe collapse. Again, note that there's no air bronchogram in these portions of the lung. And if you look at the bronchus to the lower lobe there, if you can follow that black line straight down into that area of consolidation, you can see that the bronchus is interrupted centrally and this is an, uh, an endobronchial occlusion, again, caused by a cancer. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, here we have complete collapse of the lung, right? And the, the mediastinum is totally shifted over into the left hemithorax. And you'll note that the stomach bubble is elevated and the diaphragm is right above the stomach, so the, that, that's another sign of volume loss. So we got mediastinal shift and we got diaphragmatic shift, so we know this is collapse. On the other hand, when you have a pleural effusion, what happens, you get increased volume in that portion of the lung, and it tends to shift the mediastinum over towards the other side. Here we can see the trachea coming down and the heart all shifted over towards the right. Can you see the stomach bubble, that little bit of air there um, in the upper abdomen? This is the stomach bubble, the diaphragm should be right above that, and everything on top of that is fluid. So this is of increased volume caused by a pleural effusion. All right, we're going to go back to the basic patterns of disease. Okay, we talked about airspace disease, and we've pretty well finished that topic. And now we're going to just talk about interstitial disease. And in particular, we're going to talk about pulmonary edema. There's perivascular interstitial disease, as I told you previously, and there's parenchymal interstitial disease. The perivascular, the commonest, is pulmonary edema, but you can also have sarcoidosis and other things that cause perivascular diseases. But the parenchymal diseases are the ones like interstitial pulmonary fibrosis that cause a loss of the ability to diffuse oxygen across those membranes. We're going to look at the asinus again, and I don't think I have to go over the interstitial spaces. There's the, peri, uh, the bronchovascular interstitial space around the bronchus and around the artery. There's a subpleural interstitial space, which is, goes around the whole lobule. And then there is the parenchymal interstitial space, and these are the three. So first we're going to talk about the perivascular interstitial space, and in particular about pulmonary edema. Now this is another diagrammatic um, depiction of what happens in pulmonary edema. When we get excess fluid in the lung, the first thing that happens is that fluid escapes into the bronchovascular interstitial space, the space around the bronchi and the vessels. And that happens first in the center of the lung. And that makes the vessels look bigger and it makes them look fuzzy or ill-defined. They're not as sharp. And not as sharp because the interface between soft tissue and air is smudged. The second thing that's going to happen is we're going to get fluid in the subpleural space, as you can see here. So we get fluid that collects in the pleura, and we're going to get pleural effusions, and we're going to get septal lines, like curly B lines, all these things. Those are going to happen as fluid begins to accumulate in the interstitial space of the lung. Here we have a normal on the, on the left side, and on the right side we have the same patient okay, with interstitial pulmonary edema. I think you can appreciate that the hyla are bigger, upper lobe vessels are distended, and the perihyla region is fuzzy, ill-defined. I think you can also pick out one or two bronchi that you can see end on where there is peribronchial cuffing. Okay? There's no consolidation in this lung. 
There's no curly bee lines. This is the first stage of interstitial pulmonary edema. <coughs> we go to the lateral view. Here's a normal lateral view on your left, but on your right, this is a patient with pulmonary edema, same patient. You can see that there's fluid in the fissures. You can see the major fissure and the minor fissure with fluid in them. You can appreciate that the hyla is bigger, especially the right hilum, is quite a bit bigger on this film. And the vessels are ill-defined centrally. They're not well seen. If you look closely posteriorly, there may be small pleural effusions present as well. So this is what mild interstitial edema looks like on the lateral. Here's another patient. This is obviously a dialysis patient with interstitial edema. And again, the hyla are big. Vessels are fuzzy. They're ill-defined because there's fluid around them. You can definitely see a endon bronchus in the left hilum, which has peribronchial cuffing. In this patient, we can see curly B lines, which are at the lung periphery on both sides. So we have interstitial pulmonary edema here, which is quite this is another patient, same thing. Bronchi, you can see peribronchial cuffing centrally. Hyla are enlarged. Upper lobe vessels are ill-defined and smudged. All of them are centrally. And we have curly B lines. On the lateral view, we've got fluid in the fissures and we've got lots of interstitial. And here's an example of the curly B lines. These are lines that are perpendicular to the pleural surface. And they just represent fluid in the intralobular septa of the lung. So what are some of the signs of interstitial pulmonary edema? First of all, the vessels look larger and they're indistinct. Secondly, there are, there's peribronchial cuffing, which you can see centrally. There's fluid in the fissures. You can often see this. Curly B lines are a feature of interstitial pulmonary edema. Pleural effusions, small ones, are also a feature. So, <coughs> eventually, as interstitial edema progresses, the fluid flows over from the interstitial space into the air spaces, and we get air space edema. And this is a a dramatic, a dramatic representation of that. So when we have a normal on the left side and on the right side, we have acute airspace edema. All of the interstitial spaces are filled with fluid, and the fluid has flown over or spilled over into the air spaces, and we get airspace disease. And this is what it looks like, acute pulmonary edema. They sometimes call this a bat swing appearance. It usually happens when people have really bad, severe, acute cardiac problem. And we don't really see this pattern too much. So we've got bilateral airspace consolidation. If you look closely, you can see an air bronchogram going into the lower lobes. But we have uh, symmetrical uh, changes, and they're gravity dependent. So those are the three things that you have to remember about acute pulmonary edema. It's fluid. It flows. It's going to go to the most gravity-dependent area of the lung first. okay? And it's going to be bilateral and symmetrical. So acute airspace edema, the consolidation is bilateral. Consolidation is symmetrical. And the consolidation is gravity-dependent. Now the last area we're going to talk about is parenchymal interstitial disease. And these include things such as sarcoidosis, interstitial pneumonitis, silicosis, IPF, other conditions that will cause an increase in the amount of parenchymal interstitial uh, tissue and decrease the ability of oxygen to diffuse across the membranes in the lung. So this is a uh, diagrammatic re representation. Again, we have increase in the parenchymal interstitial uh, space, and this filled up with uh, more tissue than it needs. Interstitial pneumonia is an example of this. Uh, PCP and mycoplasma can cause what we call interstitial 
uh, pneumonitis, which gives you a ground glass appearance in both lungs. Here we can see the hyla, and we can still see the vessels, and you'll notice that we can see the heart borders. There's no silhouetting in this disease. But what happens is you get a fine interstitial change in the lungs and you get infiltration of the interstitial spaces. So this is not airspace disease, this is interstitial disease. It gives you this ground glass appearance. Again, normal and the ground glass consolidation we see in an interstitial pneumonia. Now, before I leave you, I just want to say a couple of words about some of the patterns of pneumonia, okay? There are three different patterns of pneumonia that we see in radiology. The first I'm going to talk about is a low bar pneumonia, and most of the examples that you've seen uh, that I showed today are examples of low bar pneumonia. Low bar pneumonias uh, are caused by hematogenous spread of bacteria to the periphery of the lung, usually. It involves usually a whole lobe of the lung, so you can say there's right upper lobe or left lower lobe. It needn't involve every segment of the lung, but it tends to flow from one area of the lung to the other through the pores of con and involve large areas of the lung, lobar pneumonias. It's, usually, it's always unilateral. And the commonest pathogen is strep pneumonia. Now when strep gets into the lung, it causes a huge outpouring of fluid. And that fluid is what causes the consolidation that we see on the chest x-ray. It's not so much pus, but fluid that is filling the, the air spaces. As the, the pneumonia resolves, it tends to resolve without scarring. And all this fluid gets resorbed, and it really is a bad thing to have. This is a typical um, low bar pneumonia, and again, I've shown you this case before. This is a uh, pneumonia involving the entire right lower with the lateral. And the air bronchogram is characteristic of this type of uh, illness. On the other hand, bronchopneumonia is a different kind of pneumonia. It's, it's caused usually by uh, inhaled pathogens, and so you get a central bronchial inflammation. <coughs> this is going to lead to peribronchial cuffing centrally, and it's going to also lead to mucus plugging. Now, most of the disease is within the bronchial tree itself, so you get an inflammation within the bronchus. And when that happens, um, you're going to get small areas of consolidation in both lungs. So you get patchy bilateral airspace consolidation, which is due to inflammation and which if the inflammation is great enough, a mucus plug will form and will block off that bronchus distally. Okay, so it's bilateral because it's inhaled, it's asymmetrical, and the commonest pathogen is Staph aureus. Now these uh, pneumonias tend to be very virulent. They tend to cause a lot of damage and scarring in the lung. So they're not um, the same as a low bar pneumonia at all. They cause this bronchial infection and people can end up with bronchiectasis or bronchitis as a result of a bronchopneumonia because it can damage the bronchi. Now this is an example of a bronchopneumonia and I'm sorry it's not the best. But there are patchy areas of consolidation in both lungs. If you look at the right diaphragm and you follow it in, there's silhouetting of the inner aspect of the right hemidiaphragm. If you look at the left hemidiaphragm, there are areas of silhouetting over the left diaphragm um, throughout. And then there's a patchy area of increased density adjacent to the major fissure in the right upper lobe there. That's another area of consolidation. So this is patchy bilateral airspace consolidation. Again, if we look centrally on the left side, you should be able to see a bronchus coming right out at you. And that's another characteristic is peribronchial cuffing, very common in this disease. Now when you see children coming into uh, emergency with pneumonia, uh, they commonly have a bronchopneumonia. They rarely get low bar pneumonia. Here's another example of an adult with a bronchopneumonia. Patchy bilateral airspace consolidation. You can see here we've lost most of the right diaphragm 
part of the central portion of the left diaphragm, and there are areas of consolidation in the mid lung on the right side. There's silhouetting of the heart border as well. So all of these are patchy bilateral areas of consolidation. Here's another one, same thing, bilateral patchy airspace consolidation with peribronchial cuffing centrally. If you look at the upper aspect of the right hilum, you can see that there. And this is what it looks like on CT. You get bilateral areas that are sort of in the center of these little asini and they're around bronchi. And this is what it looks like when it becomes more severe and more confluent. But again, it's bilateral, asymmetrical. Now the last kind of pneumonia we're going to talk about is interstitial pneumonia. It involves the interstitial parenchymal space, okay? The one that surrounds the um, sacs, the air sacs. It gives you a ground glass opacity initially in both lungs, okay? This is sometimes very difficult to identify and often these people come into emergency very short of breath, almost turning blue, and they have what looks like a normal chest x-ray. If that ever happens to you, you do a CT scan right away because with CT we can really uh, see the interstitial pneumonias much better. There's sparing of the lung periphery in most cases, so we get a black um, cortex around the lung and this ground glass center. The disease tends to be bilateral and fairly symmetrical. And if you let it go long enough, it will lead to airspace consolidation. And finally, the co commonest pathogen is mycoplasma and pneumocystis. So when you're looking at these patients with this kind of disease, you're going to think AIDS. Here again, we've got these examples that I showed you before of a normal chest x-ray and the same patient with interstitial pneumonitis. You can see that the ground glass pattern is evident in both lungs. If you look closely, if you look closely over the diaphragm, can you see the black there, okay, um, there's sparing of the lung periphery for some reason in these uh, patients. There's no silhouetting of the diaphragm or the heart border or anything. You just get this diffuse ground glass appearance. Here's another one with the same thing here. We're starting to get airspace disease. And we're beginning to see an air bronchogram. Can you see the air bronchogram on the right side branching down into the lower lobe? Again, no silhouetting of any, any borders here. This is what it looks like on CT scan, and again, if you look closely, there's just a sort of a ground glass pattern in both lungs. And if we let this go on long enough, we develop airspace disease in these patients. And again, bilateral, symmetrical airspace disease with an air bronchogram going everywhere. And this is uh, quite characteristic of end-stage interstitial pneumonitis. And this is what that would look like on CT scan. All right, so I finished uh, doing my part. Now I've got a test here at the end, and uh, I think you should just go through it on your own. If you click once, uh, just push, push this uh, space bar once, and you'll get to the next slide. Push it a second time, and an image will appear, an uh, x-ray image. Decide what you think about that image, whether it's a pneumonia, whether it's interstitial pulmonary edema, whatever. Push the space bar again, and the answer will come up at the top of the slide. Okay? I'm just going to see how you do on this. All right, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I hope you had learned something, um, and I hope that uh, you'll know how to look at a chest x-ray. Thanks. Oh.